So welcome to this meeting. This is a little bit about um, about the fund. Um, uh, someone, someone asked me if it's okay to ask about the companies. Um, I love questions about the companies. I like my investors to feel an attachment to the companies to know where their money is. So you're very welcome to ask uh, anything you want about the companies, uh, also about how I invest or anything I've written about. Uh, your questions are very welcome. Uh, I just ask people to restrict themselves uh, to one question, so hopefully um, we can get through so as many people as possible can have the opportunity to ask. <laughs> Um, but it's no problem to, to get back in uh, in queue and ask a second question later on if there's uh, if there's still time. And um, if anyone is uh, watching on the YouTube stream as well, we're going to keep a, an eye on the comments section. And if there's any good questions there, we might um, take a handful of those as well. Okay. So with that, uh, who would like to go first? To ask you about Facebook as kind of a rough 12 months, <laughs> and uh, I think you're still invested, so maybe you can just give us an update on, on how you view Facebook these days. Yeah, I mean, um, there's obviously a lot, a lot to be said uh, about Facebook. Uh, I'm still invested, and I actually uh, increased the state quite substantially uh, at the end of last year, so I'm still very much uh, a believer in the company and also its uh, mission. I think it's important to say that because. Um, there's very few constituencies out there who really are in a position to speak up for the, for the company. The company itself has to uh, appear humble, um, uh, whereas uh, the you know the journalists and whatever they, they have their own agenda. That Facebook is effectively a competitor to them. Um, so I am a big fan of uh, the company. I want that definitely to be on the record. Um, and in terms of the problems, um, you know I think um, you know I think it's instructive so to to compare what the Chinese internet uh, looks like with uh, the Western uh, internet. So if you go to China, where there's also um, one, in particular one uh, or two dominant social networks, uh, Tencent, uh, WeChat, and, and Weibo, these networks were built from day one for censorship. Um, the, the chances of the type of scandals in terms of election inf interference and that kind of stuff happening in China are pretty close to zero because right from day one, the, the, they were built for censorship. And the chances of um, you know any bad um, comments or, or, or forbidden comments coming through were, were almost zero because that's probably the single biggest risk for these companies. If, if, they, if they become a destabilizing element for the government, they would close them down uh, immediately. Um, and if you look at Facebook, um, you know the complete opposite was the case. Facebook is a reflection of our Western values, where um, you know freedom of speech and openness um, uh, are valued very highly. And there was always um, uh, the assumption of Facebook that um, the more connections you make, um, uh, you know, the better, um, the better the world will become, and, and uh, you know, the better things things will be. And you know, clearly, there's no perfect situation. If you have a very censored uh, social internet, then no bad stuff comes through. But of course, a lot of good stuff gets uh, censored as well. And the opposite case, um, if you have a very open uh, internet, then a lot of uh, all of the good stuff gets through, but some of the some of the bad stuff uh, does too. So, um, frankly, I much prefer to live uh, in uh, or to be a member of our society and culture rather than uh, the alternative one. Um, but um, but clearly, you know, the less of the bad stuff, uh, the better. Um, but I do think um, there's also, you know. Uh, there is bad stuff that happens on Facebook, and it's uh, it's uh, I think doing you know doing its best to to address that. But it's important to realise it's never going to be eliminated. You know, Facebook is basically humanity. I mean, it, there's there's two billion people on it. Um, you know, a large part of humanity outside of China uh, is on there, and humanity has very you know has many beautiful aspects, but it also has some some bad aspects, and so. It's really a mirror to ourselves as opposed to something separate to ourselves. And, and so we shouldn't be surprised if, if sometimes bad things happen. But the question is, does the good offset, uh, offset the bad? And you know, I clearly believe, uh, believe that's the case. Um, and I'd probably draw an analogy to, to the, the city as well. So if you think about it, um, you know, the main driver of human development over the last centuries has been the formation of cities, it's cities where productivity improves, where uh, inventions take place where, where people connect, and so um, everybody understands that cities are, are, are really good things. But um, 
you know, of course, in cities as well, you have a lot more crime than in villages. In villages, everybody knows each other. There's a lot of uh, social control. Um, and, and so, um, you know, really bad things happen in cities as well. You have robberies and murders and, uh, and, and this kind of stuff. But no one really says, hmm, I think we should close down all these cities and go back to, to living in villages because we understand that there's a trade-off to that and for all the, the faults of cities, um, um, the benefits are much, much higher. And uh, I would make a similar analogy to Facebook that um, people having the opportunity to connect, um, uh, there's so much good that comes out of that which tends not to get reported. Um, um, and, but the, the good by you know, a million miles uh, offsets uh, the bad stuff. You want to come back? Just a follow on the departures, Instagram and WhatsApp, and the toddlers departing? Well, you know, it's not unusual for founders to depart from, uh, from businesses. Um, if anything, um, you know, they stay a very long time, so um, uh, compared to what would probably be the average. So I think there's a, you know, depending on whether you're a kind of half a glass half full or a glass half empty type of person, um, you can take a different perspective on that. But um, you know that, uh, you know, I think the dispute was over um, the monetization of these um, of these apps, and in particular on WhatsApp, really no real monetization model has, has emerged yet. And so I think you know, Mark Zuckerberg had a lot of patience, um, but there comes a point where you know, a decision has to be made. So. You know, perhaps as, as a particular WhatsApp moves on to its next um, you know, stage of its life, um, um, yeah, maybe a different manager is the right person for it. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Hi, Rob. Um, my, my question is on, uh, on credit acceptance. And, uh, I know you, you, you visited uh, the company and uh, you have an opinion about uh, management. So my question is, um, how dependent is uh, credit acceptance on, on, on Greg Roberts, the CEO? And or, or what, what, what happens if uh, Greg Roberts gets hit, hit by a truck? What, 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 what is, 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 is uh, credit, accept, <coughs> credit acceptance very, very dependent on, on Greg Roberts? And second part of the question, what role does um, Tom uh, Try for us today for from the credit acceptance. Okay, uh, two good questions. So for, for those who aren't familiar with it, credit acceptance is a, a U.S. company which uh, makes subprime loans in uh, in the for, for the purchase of cars in uh, in the U.S. Um, so you know, I think the way to think about the importance of CEOs in general is that um, you know clearly you have some types of businesses which are very dependent on a genius sort of designer or or founder, so you know, some might argue that Steve Jobs and Apple was a case where this one person's creative genius was was you know, instrumental in the company's uh, success. Um, and there's other companies where there's just a, a process uh, in place, um, and no one person is really um, crucial for um, you know for, for, for some genius inspiration for a new product or whatever. The process is subject to incremental improvement, but the process is, is basically in place. And you know, I think most of our companies that would be the case. So, you know, Grainger is a very process-driven uh, company, um, and credit acceptances as well. The, the processes um, that they have in place are really, um, you know, irrespective of whether it's how they make the loan, how they collect the loan, um, how Brent interacts with his employees. It's it's really just uh, just astonishing. So, I would answer that it's not um, uh, the business per se is not on a day-to-day -day basis in any way dependent uh, on Brett. Uh, but if it's not a contradiction to say so, I think Brett is an incredibly important person for the business because he's the one who lives and breathes uh, the culture, who gets out and meets with the staff on a, on a, on a regular basis, with open-hand meetings for the whole company level, also at the group level. So this wonderful system that they have in place, he's really the, the guardian of it. Uh, and does an incredible job um, of that. So, um, um, you know, so my answer, if it's not too much of a contradiction, would be um, um, he's very, very important, but he's not, uh, he's not the reason why the company is successful. Um, and then in terms of Tom Triforce, so Tom is a very private uh, person. I hope he doesn't mind me uh, discussing him here. Um, 
Uh, so Ton is a, a, a private investor um, uh, who I also believe uh, teaches at uh, Columbia, uh, Columbia University and is known to many of you as, a, as, as really a, a wonderful investor. And although um, uh, I've probably only met him probably four or five times in my life, I would, he's someone I would consider a mentor as well. Um, he's a wonderful thinker about uh, investments. Um, and uh, I think I also mentioned him in my, my, my most recent letter. And um, if you speak to Brett Roberts, he'll say that Tom has been uh, a very important factor um, in, the, uh, in the company's success. As um, when he first invested in the company, which I believe was over a decade ago, the company had a lot of things it was doing very well. So it had, for example, this idea that the dealer um, uh, partners in the risk of a loan, which was uh, uh, Don Foss's original genius idea, if, if you will. So it had a wonderful business model, um, but what it was lacking is what Brett would describe as a scorecard. So it knew it was doing well, but it didn't know how well it was doing. And he described it that if you, if you don't have a scorecard, you don't really know whether you're winning, or you don't really know how to improve. And Brett would credit Tom with being the person who kind of introduced concepts to the company of economic value added um, and this kind of stuff, which, um, um, you know, which has been a very important reason for why credit acceptance has, has continued to become even more successful um, uh, over time. Um, and, you know, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Tom is, is someone I view as a mentor and someone I would look up to. And I think for me, and I would also encourage other investors as well, I think there's an enormous amount of value we can add to companies by being positive activists. So not the negative activists who go in and say, hey, everything is wrong, we should be, you know, you should fire the CEO and do everything differently. But uh, positive activists in the same, in the sense that we're permanently thinking from the perspective of an, an owner of the company, a long-term owner of the company, how can this company uh, become better? You know, which, which best practices do we see in companies in different countries or different cultures, which can maybe be relevant to the companies uh, that we're, we're invested in? And so that's something that Tom has done like, spectacularly well um, uh, in his investments and it's something that I uh, aspire to do, to do more and more to, to not be someone who's just asking questions when I meet with, um, with the managers of my company but proactively giving ideas on how the business can, can become better. Thanks for the question. Georg? Yeah, good morning. Um, Rob, can you tell us um, about the stuff you quietly sold? And uh, didn't write about, and uh, where you um, were maybe off. That's the first part. And do you re regret any of these sales in hindsight? So, for, for the last year, or since the um, since the, the start of the fund, or since the start. Since the start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I tend not to discuss uh, discuss it when I sell a company. Um, as um, you know, I obviously I always want to be very open and honest in my communication with my investors, and um, I don't want to feel. And, and obviously, if I've built up a, a good relationship with a manager over a long period of time, um, I tend not to. Um, I, you know, I don't want to have to write in my letter why I think they're, they're no longer that good or something like that. I think that would um, be a little bit outside of my comfort zone and not, not really of any use. So. Uh, I don't write about sell decisions uh, unless the company does does very poorly, in which case uh, I, I write about it then um, uh, in, the, in the interest of transparency. So if I go back to um, you know the start of the fund, um, I'm happy to say I've never um, um, you know I think um, I, you know I would I would divide the sale of decisions into into two types. Um, there were the ones where, um, you know, so, so my investment hypothesis whenever I invest in a company is this is a great company, it's going to grow for the next 10 years and uh, become very valuable. And of course, hypotheses don't always work out. And if I see a flaw in the original hypotheses, like for example, there's a disruption on the horizon, or the management isn't being as rational in its capital allocation as I thought it was, then of course, um, that would be a, a good reason to sell. And when I've done that in the past, um, you know, for example, Honda Holding or Havisco, um, two companies that spring, you know, top of my head, or Nova Nordisk I sold um, you know, because uh, the, the growth wasn't as strong as I'd, I'd originally hoped for. Um, those decisions I've never really regretted, and if I, if I look at the share price subsequent to, um, to after the sell decision, 
Um, you know, I think they're, they were generally good decisions. The companies have tended not to do particularly well afterwards, although thankfully none have been disasters. Um, and in particular, the companies that I brought and said have, have definitely done a lot better. So that would be the one aspect of the companies I've sold. And then there's the other type, which is, uh, for me, the hall of shame, which is the companies where I continue to be enthusiastic about the business and the perspective and the, uh, and the managers, but my kind of, um, you know, I had sort of two, two voices in my head. I had the kind of the Ben Graham voice here saying, this stock is too expensive, you're a value investor, you should sell it. And you know, I had this other voice in my head here saying, um, this is a wonderful business, you want to become, you want to be an owner of for the long term, and who cares if it becomes expensive every now and again. And whenever I listen to my Ben Graham uh, voice, at least in the past, I've ended up regretting it deeply. <laughs> And um, although numerically uh, the number of sell decisions uh, were very good, in terms of what happened to those minority I sold uh, and regretted, they've, they've done really spectacularly well. So, um, you know, for example, um, when the fund started, started actually, I think, uh, you know, I've had about 30% of the company in, or 35 even, in growing for leasing. But I also had about 20 or, or maybe more percent in uh, a small machine machine building company in southern Germany called Hemle. And that really is a, a just a wonderful, wonderful business. And you know, I think that stock, since I sold it, um, or at least since I when I first bought it, would have you know paid back my purchase price many times, at least once over in dividends and, and has also increased its earning power by, by many multiples since then. So so those type of stocks uh, which I sold I, I really regret. Um, I think Betley would potentially also be an example in that uh, in that category. Um, but the great thing is, you know, we're, we're you know, as investors, we have to be learning machines. And so I always look back at past decisions and try to figure out, okay, if I want to be better in the future, what should I do differently? And so, you know, my real response to that was to cali calibrate my thinking a little bit and try to kind of weight this Ben Graham voice a little bit uh, less strongly in my head and, and the, uh, the wonderful business voice, try to give that a little bit uh, extra, uh, extra weight. So. Um, you know, hopefully um, the type of mistake will, will be less prevalent in the, in the next 10 years than it was in the first 10 years. I have a question on um, management remuneration. And I was particularly very keen to hear your thoughts on to what degree does it, is, is it very important for you when you assess management? And what is a very, I would say, uh, remarkable or impressive management remuneration structure that you've come across and that you would like to see more often? Yeah. That's, that's a great question. Um, and um, you know, I think I, I actually wrote in a, in a presentation uh, a year ago in the context of management and judging management, but I actually thought um, the importance of incentivization is, is way overrated uh, by people. And, um, I got a lot of emails about that, people were asking me to clarify what I was thinking, so, so thank you for, for asking that question. So, um, you know, there's, there's all these sort of um, quotes, you know, and Charlie Munger said something along the lines of, um, he's never been, he's never been ceased to be amazed about how important incentives are, uh, and even though he's studied it more than anybody else, even he's been surprised by, by how important it is himself. And um, in my experience, actually, um, Incentives can do a lot of damage. So when when managements do crazy irrational things, and you think, you know, what on earth were they thinking of there? Oftentimes, uh, a poorly designed remuneration package is, is the reason that's uh, that's the case. of Wells Fargo was a recent example where there was a lot of mis-selling or, or, or fake accounts uh, because that's the way the salespeople were, were remunerated. So I agree with Charlie Munger that a lot of damage can be done with with the way incentives are, are structured. But I disagree strongly that financial incentives are what motivates the great managers. Um, so, if, if you know, I, in fact, I can't think of a single case where uh, of, a, of a great manager where the primary incentivation has been uh, uh, a financial one. Um, you know, Norman Redrop, who's also a great mentor to me, one of his his first question when he's judging a management is always, um, does the management love the money or do they love the task? Um, and uh, you know, if they love the money, then we, we tend to pass on them. And if they love the task, then that's what we're looking for. 
it maybe sounds a little bit weird, but you know, maybe a good analogy is to a sports person. So, you know, if you win the World Cup or if you win Wimbledon, you of course you make a lot of money from, from doing that. Um, but I don't think as you know, kind of Nadal is in the fifth set tiebreak with uh, Roger Federer and he's sort of straining at the sign used to, to to get over the line to, to win the to win Wimbledon. I don't think it's the kind of the the financial prize which is really any kind of factor in his thinking there. It's obviously the love of the game and the, the love of the competition. So that's what I'm really looking for. So in a financial uh, incentivization, I guess what I'm saying is uh, what I'm looking for is alignment. Uh, so I'm not really looking for it to be a carrot which which would inspire um, the management to do great things because the inspiration has to come from somewhere else. But alignment is super important. So it shouldn't it shouldn't be so poorly devised that the management starts behaving uh, irrationally or or perhaps um, um, it's devised in a way that um, the management does amazing things and then um, you know doesn't earn you know the money that it deserves so that could also be demotivating for people you know the Dalai Lama Wimbledon and you know the TV rights were you know hundreds of millions for that and uh, he was to be given a you know a 10 euro check um, you know, he probably feel a little bit hard done by and maybe not come back to Wimbledon the next year. So, you know, I think alignment is, is definitely uh, important in an incentive system, but it should never be um, the primary driver of the management performance. But any structure that you've come across where you feel this particularly good for fostering Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, um, I mentioned, um, um, I mentioned in my most recent letter that, um, most companies um, tend to tend to have one, you know, sometimes just one, or probably no more than four really kind of key metrics which which really capture and, and drive the business. Um, you know, so Christina, earlier on, um, you said it was the, the profit growth and the, the profit divided by working cap capital. Um, if I think about credit acceptance, it's the economic value added, which is what Brett thinks about as the, the scorecard. So, in an ideal compensation system, that metric, which is the one which the, uh, the organization really thinks about, that should be the, the key one, which is also um, you know, driving the performance element of the, um, the, the compensation scheme. Um, and there's a lot of value for companies in, in trying to figure out that compensation question because it really makes you think about what is it that really drives our business. And, and like I said in, in my most recent letter, I think the really good companies, um, they really only have just a handful of, of metrics which they, they follow and sometimes really just one. Yeah. Hey Rob, uh, my question relates to a PSG group uh, and I wanted to ask you how do you value it? Um, so how deep do you go into the subsidiaries like Capitec, Cool, um, in what margin of safety are you looking at? You refer to that in your uh, first half of your letter. And then how do you factor in political or currency risk, which you also alluded to in the letter? Thanks. Yeah, thank you um, for the question. So, so PSG, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a, is a holding company. Um, so um, it owns lots of uh, individual businesses, a little bit like uh, Berkshire Hathaway has car insurance and you know, um, chocolate uh, or candy stores and everything. Uh, PSG is, is a similar structure, uh, but with a different set of businesses. So when you have very disparate businesses, um, it poses a, um, a valuation challenge uh, because obviously the, the consolidated figures don't really make a lot of sense if you're mixing in such, uh, such a different bunch of businesses. Um, so the way I value PSG Group is um, you know, some of the parts uh, methodology where I, um, you know, I, I look for the um, the companies which it owns and which make up the biggest part of its um, of its value, and value those uh, individually, like standalone businesses. So, um, which is in the case of PSG, which is it's, it's a, a little bit easier than other holding companies because most of its businesses are themselves separately listed on the stock exchange. So you have annual reports. You can you, you can meet with the management. You can discuss the businesses with them, um, and so. Um, so concretely, I would value um, the individual businesses of, of PSG Group, um, in particular Capitec, which is their bank, uh, Kuro, which is their uh, education, their private schools business, 
and, um, uh, and PSG Consult, which is their kind of wealth advisory business. Um, so that's a big aspect of how I value the company. But there's, um, there's another aspect which I think is also super, super important, um, which is, um, um, you know, Pete, who runs the business, and, and formerly his father, are really wonderful capital allocators. Um, uh, they really understand capital allocation uh, very deeply. Um, and they're really very um, uh, adapted to the South African situation. So they have very deep networks in there. They have a, a very strong brand recognition. Um, so you have this wonderful combination of people who know how to allocate capital and combined with people that approach them with projects or, or companies um, where they can allocate their capital to. So it's really a wonderful situation. And although I don't know concretely which investments they're going to make and how valuable they're going to become over the next 10 years, I'm certain um, that there will be those investments and it will be um, a big source of value. Um, so that's how I kind of um, think about the valuation. Um, and in terms of kind of political risk, um, you know, um, if, if Yanni was here, he would have said something along the lines of, you know, don't talk about risk, talk about opportunity, because, um, you know, if, if, there's, if South Africa is an unstable, risky place, which it definitely is compared to, say, Sweden, um, then that obviously has certain risks, which is very easy to understand, but it also has opportunities, which are perhaps less, less obvious. Um, and, the, you know, there's a, there's a real shortage of capital um, um, in South Africa, and that makes the situation of, for Pete as a capital allocator you know, really ideal. You know, so people approach him with ideas um, for, for capital allocation, um, you know, such as the schools or, or, or the bank. Um, you know, there, there would just be you know, this, these opportunities of, of, of past in Europe. You know, there's no opportunity to build you know, the UK's largest bank anymore or Germany's largest bank. I mean, the, the incumbents are already, um, they're already there. And so the political instability of, um, of South Africa also has, uh, has, has opportunities in it as well. And, um, you know, I don't think I would necessarily want um, all of business owners' capital to be in South Africa, um, but I think it's entirely appropriate that uh, a part of it is there as well. Um, and actually, just as an aside, I, I recently read um, a book called Factfulness. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone is... Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It was uh, written by Hans Rosling, who, who unfortunately died recently. And he was uh, a Swede as well, who was famous for kind of popularizing uh, statistics um, about population development. And um, um, one of the things I read in this book is, um, and I emphasize I only read this a few weeks ago, so it had nothing to do with my investment decision, but I was nevertheless happy to read it, is if you look at the world's population today, um, um, he says you have to use a pin number of 1114. So there's one billion in the Americas, there's one billion in Europe, there's one billion in Africa, and there's four billion in Asia. And he then asks in his book, you know, what, in, in 2100, um, what do you think that uh, distribution would be? And if he was here, he would ask everyone, and everyone would get it wrong, and he would say something like, you're worse than chimpanzees. Uh, but I won't, I won't test you. Um, but the answer is, um, the new pin number is 1145. So in... 80 years, there'd be a billion people in America, there'd be a billion uh, people in Europe, there'd be 4 billion people on the African continent, and there'd be 5 billion people in Asia. So there is just a, I mean, there's just a tsunami of consumers um, going to hit that continent uh, in the next uh, 80 years. And I would argue that PSG is the, you know, the best positioned capital allocator to, to participate in that. And so, for all the talk about risks, let's let's not forget the opportunities. Uh, how do you think about Amazon's entry into the advertising business with respect to Google and Facebook? Andreas, thank, thanks for the question. Um, and uh, I, I should emphasize that I never get the questions in advance, uh, but um, <laughs> in this particular case, we did have a coffee uh, uh, a few days ago, and we're talking a little bit about this. So um, I just want to. Have that as a, as a disclaimer, and um, you know your your comment on this, which I thought was, uh, was super smart, was that um, you know Amazon, the company, is um, uh, a, a, a competitor and a risk uh, to Google. Um, you know the more 
consumer goods or whatever else it is that gets sold on Amazon, as that's a destination for people to go, and probably the less advertising it gets, uh, let's call it gets bought on, on, on Google. But the advertising business of Amazon per se is most likely not a threat to Google, because if someone is searching for a toaster on Amazon, whether that gets sold through Amazon's first party um, or whether it gets sold on through an advertisement through the, the third party marketplace, it's kind of revenue which is lost to, to, to Google either way. So, you know, I think your point was that advertising um, is not the threat, it's really the Amazon ecosystem per se. Um, but overall, um, you know, I think competition is good. Um, in the case of Google, I think probably the biggest risk is not too much competition, it's actually too little. If there's too little, then you know, the regulatory risk will, will increase more and more over time. So um, you know, I think a strong Amazon, which is taking share from, from Google, and, and, um, or, or at least um, you know, growing rapidly in, in, in product search, and you know, obviously a strong Apple, which is growing um, iPhone sales versus Android and stuff. You know, I think for the, for the ecosystem as a whole, I think that's a, a positive thing. And, um, you know, it's also important to realize that, you know, it's not that Amazon isn't really taking share from Google. Um, you know, kind of Google and Amazon are taking share from, from everybody else, in particular the more kind of physical uh, retailers and older style business models. So, um, you know, I think um, both companies are going to continue to be very, very successful. Hi. A bit, bit of a clumsy question, but in my experience, uh, a value, our values tend to make a bit of religion about their own personal interpretation of what value is, but it goes, to, as you're saying there, be the bank ram over here, and then finally one of the compounders, you'll be grand in the end. But what I worry about is, in the last decade or so, people spend a lot of time on why they buy something, and they have the bank ram voice louder. They won't be able to get more. They move over, this size income warrants a quality company, they try more quotes and so on. And I wonder whether <clears throat> the lessons they've been learning, they don't worry, let's move all in that direction. It's been a bit self reinforcing. I'm not sure that's the right lesson. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, your question is about valuation, and it's probably the everything that ultimately comes down to, to valuing and trying to pick the company which is the most undervalued versus everything else. It's something you have to constantly think about and develop. And, and it's important to remember that everyone else is doing the same thing. So even if something, even if you figure everything perfectly out, I think anyone ever would, but even if you did, um, you know, very quickly um, the market would move and people would start doing things differently. And so uh, it would be no use, you, you would still have to continue to learn. Um, but that being said, um, I disagree a little bit with the spirit of your question that um, maybe people have shifted too far from one extreme to another. Um, I think, um, the Ben Graham approach of, uh, you know, maybe I'm being unfair to the great man, but let's just call it the kind of the fundamentalist value approach of focusing very much on just quantitative figures, um, you know, very low price books or low low PEs. I think that's something which um, has been spectacularly unsuited to what's happened with our economy in the last sort of 10 or 15 years. You know. Um, the economy has been completely remade over the last um, 15 year, years by, by the internet. Um, it's kind of comparable to moving from, you know, kind of the horse and car to, to, to the automobile or you know, the advent of electricity and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if the economy is, is going to be rebuilt, then um, my fear is that focusing on price to book and that type of things is almost going to automatically lead you down in the direction of focusing on those companies which are probably asset heavy, have quite old style business models, and on average are going to be precisely the wrong places you want your money to be um, uh, in, in a situation where the economy has been, been remade. And I think that was a very difficult lesson for value investors because we all look up so much to, to Ben Graham and, and obviously um, most people discover value investing uh, through him. Um, but it wasn't difficult actually for normal people. So normal people, you know, actually you asked, you know, five years ago, is the internet changing the economy? People, you know, a man on the street would have laughed at you. Um, but value investors still, to a large extent, um, you know, continued using these, these old methods. And so 
if I speak to my fellow value investors today, what I get the sense is um, not so much a style drift over the last 10 years towards away from the kind of low price to books to, to more kind of better quality companies. I, I would say it's more of a kind of a learning process or an unlearning of the old stuff and, and the learning of, uh, of the new stuff. Um, so um, uh, I would probably take a slightly less negative view on it than, uh, than you have, but you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's not set in stone that compounding companies will always be cheap and low price level companies will always be expensive. Um, as I wrote in the last letter, the only situation that compounders would structurally continue to be cheap is where people only focus on the price to book or the price to earnings and ignore all the wonderful stuff that's going to happen in the coming 10 years. If people continue to ignore that, then compounders would indefinitely be structurally underpriced. But, you know, people, people learn, um, people recalibrate their model, their investment models like I've done and like many of you have done. And what I would expect is uh, over time for this type of compounding businesses to be priced much more efficiently. Um, and then, you know, perhaps the opportunity would be in, in different pockets of the market. Um, but ultimately, what it always comes down to is you're just trying to buy cash flow at the cheapest possible price. So you, you have to compare how much cash you're getting relative to the price of a compounder to a more asset heavy business and, and what have you. And then always make the most uh, rational decision. Thank you. So this is a guest question from YouTube. Uh, I'll paraphrase. You talked a little bit about the social network ecosystem in China. Um, could you spend a bit more time talking about how you spend your time in China, the overall knowability of some of those companies? Uh, the, the asker of the question talked about businesses like Tencent and Alibaba. So, you know, how much time do you spend? How do you think about the knowability and the triple competence in China broadly, and also the impact on some of the businesses you want to get? Thank you. So, it's a really great question. Um, so, I've, I've visited China probably about once a year uh, for the last you know six years or so, um, and focused primarily on visiting the internet companies there. And it's really been a fascinating experience because the Chinese internet is kind of hermetically sealed off from the rest of the world. So, you have it's all it's like a little bit like the Galapagos Islands where you had all these. Um, because the islands were uh, geographically separated from other islands and they had different uh, eco ecosystems, you had this amazing um, sort of flourishing of life um, on, on these individual islands. And when Charles Darwin went to visit them and saw the differences in, in the animals and how these differences were so perfectly adapted to their different environments, that's what kind of gave him the idea for, for evolution. And we kind of have a similar opportunity with the Chinese and the Western internet because obviously they all use both use, both systems have the same underlying technologies and protocols. They have smartphones, we have smartphones, and so on. But because they've um, started from a different place and um, a, a completely different uh, systems, um, they've developed very very differently. And I find it as an investor in Facebook, for example, fascinating you know, to, to be able to see in a parallel universe how things might have developed uh, completely differently. And you know, when I answered the first question about Facebook, obviously, it helped me to answer that question by having, having studied uh, Tencent. So I'm a big fan of the Chinese internet as an opportunity to learn. Uh, I'm also a fan of it as, a, as an opportunity um, to invest. And, and for, for several years, we were who we invested in Baidu, which is the kind of um, the Google of China, uh, if you will. Um, I, I kind of um, lost, it, um, you know, became less convinced about the case for Baidu, um, and that's maybe a, a different question in itself. Um, you know, search is very dominant in the West. Um, search is not a particularly important thing in 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 the in the Chinese internet for, for various reasons. There, the dominant way people access the internet is through WeChat, which belongs to Tencent. And, um, you know, so if you want to order a cab or if you want to order food or make a, a payment, you would just open the WeChat um, uh, app. Um, you know, so that's really, WeChat in a way has the, the, the position in, in the Chinese internet that maybe Google has in, in our, our uh, internet, uh, although Tencent's actually probably much more, more powerful. So um, um, I'm a big fan of the companies as well. And, visited Tencent in particular many times um, and followed very closely. Um, my only 
Um, you know, if I was running a, a 30 stock portfolio, I'm pretty sure Tencent would be, be one of them. But in a, Tencent, uh, in a 10 stock portfolio, I'm not sure I prefer um, Tencent, for example, to, to Facebook. So if I look at um, WeChat, uh, I think WeChat um, per se is a better, and more dominant business than, than Facebook's is. But um, I think it has a number of layers of uncertainty, which if you accumulate them together, mean that perhaps the probability weighted chance of WeChat being, or Tencent being a better uh, investment for Facebook uh, is not the case. So, you know, it starts with the, the VIE structure in, in China where you don't own the, um, you don't actually own the stock in, in, in Tencent, you own a right to the, the cash flows of Tencent. Um, so that's one layer of uncertainty. Then you have the kind of the, 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 the ownership uncertainty at the actual business uh, level. So, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of, in my view, very arbitrary um, treatment of the ownership of Tencent's assets. So, for example, a very big part of its value is its payments business. And um, in, in, uh, you know, in any banking or payments type business, you basically make all of your money from the deposits. You know? um, and about a year ago, the Chinese government said, okay, effectively it disenfranchised Tencent from the ownership of its deposits and now has to send all of its deposits to, um, to the central bank and receive 0% interest for that. So, I mean, it's, you know, that business has, in my view, been, that element of the business has been destroyed. I mean, just imagine a company like Wells Fargo, if they were to lose, um, lose all their deposits, I mean, the bank would effectively be worthless. Um, so there's, um, uh, you know, there's that element. Um, there's also, you know, and I think something perhaps potentially similar happening in, in gaming as well, where obviously the only way to have a decent gaming business is if you can monetize them. And uh, it's been struggling to, to monetize uh, its most recent cohort of games. And, you know, if you lose the ability to charge the customer, then effectively you're also losing business to a certain extent, although here at least there's the hope that monetization will start again at some point. Um, so, you know, basically I see a number of, uh, of layers of uncertainty, uh, which I don't mind provided um, the, the upside is sufficiently high to, to offset that. Um, but in my view, the, the, the potential compounding for Tencent is not sufficiently higher than Facebook, for, for example, to offset those those risks. So that's that's why uh, I'm not invested at the moment. But I do follow the, the company very, very closely and uh, wouldn't be surprised if, if at some point it, it is um, a company which, which we invest in. Thanks for the question. schools in South Africa probably have a positive short-term societal implications. But you could argue that like mid to long-term implications could be positive or both, but also negative. Um, at the same time, the World Economic Forum ranks like among their like top five of risks in the current risk report, three out of five are environmental. Um, how far do you assess kind of like the, the societal and environmental implications of your investments? Um, and will that change in the future now that one more environmental risk, for example, are pressing? Yeah, um, thank you. So was that two parts of the question, the one just on the schools and one on the environment, or were, were you sort of linking the, the two together? Linking, like both societal and environmental implications. Uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Um, no, so it's something um, I think about a lot um, because, you know, when I invest in something, I want to really be holding it for a very long, long time. Um, if that's the case, obviously, has to have uh, a win-win with um, with its customers, and it has to, have, you know, effectively have a win-win with the um, with society and the, the environment at large. If if a company is making money by, you know, destroying the environment or by, you know, turning their making their customers bankrupt or giving them a poor product, you know, even though that could be potentially very profitable in the short term, there's there's no possible scenario where that could could work in the long term. So as a long term holder, um, it's something I, I definitely. Um, you know, think think a lot about, um, but it's um, you know I, I do see some some funds which put the kind of sustainability as that you know they're marketed as sustainability funds and 
I do think that's the wrong way to, to approach it. I think what you have to find is where a great win-win business model comes together with uh, an attractive uh, valuation opportunity. And I'm kind of skeptical if someone weights one at the at the risk uh, or at the to, to the detriment of the other. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of these kind of sustainability type funds. Um, but I do think um, that um, anyone um, anyone who claims they're a long term investor is not thinking about sustainability is, is probably not not doing their job properly. Yeah, Jeff. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Don Foss, the founder of the of the company. He is uh, selling uh, his uh, stake of, uh, uh, of the company, or uh, already has sold uh, most of most of it. How do you see that? Is it um, because he doesn't have uh, enough con uh, confidence in the company anymore? What, what what is your opinion on that? No, no, I, I don't think that's the case uh, at all. So um, you know, firstly, I mean, Don has. You know, basically for most of the last 20 years being a seller of the stock, but the um, the company has purchased its own stock back so aggressively that his actual stake in the company has not actually changed all that much. And uh, the last time I looked, he's still a pretty, um, I mean, he's still the largest shareholder. Um, you know, so he still has a lot of uh, skin in the game, but in terms of Don's life situation, um, uh, you know, he's, um, you know, he's not the healthiest guy. I would guess he weighs probably uh, close to three three hundred pounds, if not if not more, and he's sort of in his late seventies. So he's probably thinking, you know, a lot about his succession uh, planning, and he has two daughters um, who will be the beneficiary of his stock over time, and they're not financial. They're, they're relatively normal people. They're not financially um, uh, particularly interested, as far as I'm aware. And they most likely work with uh, financial advisors to tell them what they should be doing with the stock. And so you can imagine a financial advisor if he sees a portfolio where 99% you know, of the, the wealth is in one single stock, which they don't particularly understand very well, um, which he's probably not making much in the way of fees from. His advice is probably, you know, you should be diversifying and trading and, and all this kind of stuff. So I suspect that's, um, that's the dynamic at, at play there. Um, but um, you know, I think Don uh, Don was you know the reason the company exists. He founded it. It was his idea of making the or helping the dealer to participate in the um, um, in the in, in the loan, which is what makes which is the kind of magic source of the business. But in many other respects, it was more Brent, uh, who was kind of the founder of the business, if you will, than than, than Don. So so Don is someone who is. Um, Close to illiterate, um, and um, also, you know, I think when he, when he wrote his first uh, loan contracts, you know, 30 years ago, I think there might have been some mathematical mistakes in them as well. So he brought this original idea, um, but it was really uh, Brent that created the systems and the financial controls to actually help it to scale and, and, and to make it work. So um, you know, I think um, if you're looking for where the soul of the company is. Is today it's very very clearly with Brett and, and not with Don. There's a couple of questions up the front here. Oh, you, you go first. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is regarding Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's like a maybe a, a follow up from a Tencent. So you listed that you listed a lot of risks that you see it with Tencent and regulatory risks and stuff like that. So I was wondering what kind of risks. Maybe similar risk or regulatory risk or other maybe uh, maybe disruption risk you see to Facebook. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. And I believe you, you traveled over from Israel to be here. Right? So, so thank you for making the trip away from Israel to be here. It's, uh, it's great. Um, um, you know, so um, clearly, if anything, there's, there's not enough competitive risk to, to, to Facebook, a little bit like with, with Google as well. I mean, if, if there were two or three competing social networks, then um, there would be um, you know, be less regulatory risk, and clearly that's not the case. There's no really meaningful competition that I, I can see to the Facebook ecosystem. So I think um, you know by far the biggest risk is 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 a regulatory one. And that's um, you know, but every business has risks. Um, any other company we mentioned uh, there's also risks, and, and our job as investors is not to 
avoid risks or pretend they're not existing, but to, to be aware of them and, and hopefully to, to price them correctly. And in the case of Facebook, there's, there's clearly risks, but there's clearly an amazing opportunity because it's a business growing very rapidly, which is trading on probably um, you know, a PE, which is more appropriate to a company which isn't growing at all. So um, I would definitely highlight regulatory risk. In terms of business risk, you know, I think everything, you know, you can always be glass half full or glass half empty. And last year was, of course, a terrible year in terms of news for, for Facebook. There was sort of one scandal or supposed scandal virtually every week in, in the newspaper. Um, um, and of course, you can take a negative view of that, and many people do, but the positive view is, you know, if that year doesn't destroy them, then what on earth can? Because, you know, when companies uh, are under that much pressure and that much criticism, you know, that kind of stuff, and, you know, we, we'll see uh, Facebook's results probably in about a week or, or a couple of weeks' time, but I'm pretty sure you'll see a company which is growing over the year by, you know, 30, maybe even close to, to mid-30%, and probably has uh, very high EBITDA margins. So I think that tells you it's a, it's a pretty amazing business if uh, it can have all those challenges and troubles, but still uh, have such spectacular performance. So, yeah, that's what I think about it. Hi, Rob. Hi. Thanks for organizing this great event again this year. No, thanks for the question. question is on grant funding. Um, would you be able to talk briefly on uh, what you see as the durable competitive advantages in the business and the growth opportunities? Yeah, uh, thank you. So, um, so Granker is one of the, well, it's the longest, Granker's been in the portfolio since day one um, and has been a super important investment for me, not just in terms of the returns it's made, but it's also been a kind of a template for a lot of the other companies uh, I look at. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it does uh, small ticket IT leasing. Uh, so it makes, uh, effectively makes loans to businesses for, for very small amounts, which historically um, banks couldn't uh, couldn't make. There were loads that banks couldn't process profitably. Um, banks had more, still do have very manual systems, um, uh, which were you know the cost was just too high for them to make these smaller loans to small small businesses. So you know, um, Greco's genius is is really that when it started over 30 years ago, it was kind of then we now consider it to be a kind of a fintech company, effectively. Mr. Grenker was a computer nut when the first computers started to come out and were affordable for, for normal people. And he um, effectively saw the opportunity to, to automate the whole process of, of giving a loan um, um, uh, and, and, and you know, built an incredible business uh, in that. Uh, and I think the, um, it's, you know, it's, it's never, I mean, over the last, you know, probably since its, its existence, it's grown, at, you know, double digit percentages uh, per year. And, and this year, the, the growth of new business will most likely be 20 odd percent. So it's, it's been a wonderful system. Um, but like all businesses, uh, the world is changing and things will be tougher in the future than, than they were in the past. So, um, you know, in the past, they were competing with banks who had these very manual, cost inefficient systems and, um, was obviously a very easy battle for Grenker to win. And now the kind of the internet is sort of taking off and there's more and more fintech companies. Um, you, know, they're, you know, I think that sort of process efficiency, I don't think people will be able to overtake Grenker, but its gap versus the, the competition will, will certainly certainly decrease. But it still has a lot of lot of things going for it. So I would point to two, two continuing sources of competitive advantage. And by the way, the process one is still very much a real competitive advantage because you know the main competitors are still the banks um, and they're, they're still still kind of very inefficient. But where they will continue to have big advantage is um, firstly in their data. You know, so they've obviously been collecting and refining and perfecting their, their loan data for many, many decades. And that's you know a startup today which was to start from zero wouldn't have that that, that database uh, to fall back upon. And the other thing is they have they have a really cool sales model where they have lots of um, small satellite offices which really kind of um, visit the dealers who make the loans to their clients on, on their behalf and help them to be successful and help them to um, um, you know, encourage them to make loans and, and, and this kind of stuff. So you know, that, that's, you know, that physical sales force also for a kind of a fintech startup will be, will be quite difficult to, to replicate in my view. So those are the kind of the two continuing sources of 
as it might usually see. Hi, Rob. Um, another question on Facebook. Um, uh, how do you think about the change in capital intensity of the business with them building more and more infrastructure to accommodate the shift in the videos and the increase in fixed costs? Then the second part of the question would be some people speculate that actually it's them suppressing the profits in the short term in the current environment, which they may release in the long term. Yeah, so, you know, here too, I think there's a kind of a glass half empty, glass half full way of looking at this. So, you know, obviously, as investors, we prefer a business not to be capital intensive. You know, if a company has to invest money in, in servers or equipment, that's money that isn't available for us as, as investors. So, um, so, on the one hand, it has a negative element, but it has a very positive element, which is, a, is of course, a huge source of competitive, additional source of competitive advantage for Facebook. You know, so Facebook, 10 years ago, the competitive advantage was this amazing network effect where people go to where their friends are, and then, which draws in more friends, which you know, get into this virtuous circle. And if you look at the business today, um, you still have that network effect with friends. You also still have, well, you have in addition, a network effect of content providers who make a lot of content, which um, makes Facebook an attractive destination for, for customers. But increasingly, you also have um, you know, this capital spend uh, as a um, as a as an entry barrier, you know, um, you know, for, for Mark Zuckerberg, it was possible to disrupt you know MySpace and some of the older social networks just from his sort of dawn. Whereas today, um, you know, the stakes are much higher. You have to you'd have to build all this you know these, these server capacity. Although actually, as I'm saying, I guess there's AWS, so maybe that's not quite such a, a strong point anymore. Um, but there's also you know I think. Facebook hired 20,000 people to do content moderation. Um, and, um, and of course, it's essential for the survival of the network because if bad stuff continues to happen on it, then obviously at some point people will, people will leave it. So um, I think it's going to be tough for a startup to, to, you know, to have 20,000 people doing content moderation. So I think it makes the business stronger and better. And so for the long term, it's, it's good for us as investors, but I, I don't deny that. Um, Capital intensity per se is, is, is on balance a negative as well. Um, yeah. I, I think they're building their own service to actually only the AI yeah. develop. Well, Facebook is, I was just thinking, as I, as I was responding to the question, I was thinking, you know, maybe it's not such an entry barrier for a new entry because they can, of course, scale very quickly on AWS. But yeah, Facebook definitely has, has its own service, yeah. <coughs> And I think there might also be like an element of profit suppression. I think when, when the sort of Cambridge Analytica scandal broke in the first part of the year and in the Q1 results, Facebook said, hey, we grew our profits like crazy, everything's cool. Uh, I think, um, I think some, some journalists had a, a sense of humor failure. And so uh, kind of, I don't think it's undesirable for Facebook to have slightly lower margins in the, in the second part of the year. So maybe there's that element as well. So, um Combining two questions that came in from YouTube, I think patience is a core value of the business owner fund and then you as an investor, and there are long periods of inactivity. Um, when you experience a market climate like the fourth quarter of 2018 where things start to reprice, could you talk a little bit about your process of triaging the long watch list of businesses that you may want to own someday that are at better prices? versus a decision to own more of what's in the portfolio already. Um, and I think there was some demand from the queue uh, for maybe a little more specificity about what absorbed more capital in that period of volatility. You mentioned Facebook uh, becoming yeah. substantially bigger. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, just was, uh, the first part of the question is more on uh, the first question. Uh, deciding between uh, the how, to, how to deploy into the watch list versus current companies. Yeah, yeah. So, so, first, so the word patience was was, was mentioned, and I, I kind of have um, slightly mixed feelings about that word. It sounds like a very virtuous thing thing to have, and of course, used correctly, it is important, but I think we investors sometimes have a tendency to dress up our, our failings uh, as, as, you know, with, you know, um, positive characteristics. So, for example, I remember um, uh, one investor I knew who right at in the in the you know in the two thousand nine crisis, kept all of his money in cash, 
which is, was, of course, I mean, a, a huge mistake when the opportunity set was so rich. But the way he'd process that for himself was to say he was just like a very, very conservative guy. And so, you know, the, the other people who invested in 2009, they were just kind of risk, risk takers. And, you know, so in his own mind, he sort of, he, in my view, dressed up a, a failing as a, as a virtue. And I think patience is also something where there's a risk of that happening as well. You know, um, patience per se is a good thing, but when the opportunity is there, patience is your enemy, then you have to, you know, then you have to act. Um, and so um, I, I just be a little bit careful, careful about how, um, how how that word uh, gets used. Um, no, so in um, uh, but I, I did think the the opportunities were very good in the in the fourth quarter, and fortunately had a little bit of cash in, in the fund um, through new investment or, or investors who put more cash into the fund, but also as I sold um, a particular Berkshire Hathaway in the, in the middle part of the year. Um, and um, you know, so I was. I thought it was a good opportunity to put that to work, and now the fund is more or less fully invested. And um, from memory, the the companies that absorbed most of the capital were um, Facebook, uh, Grenka, and TruePacket. And can you maybe, sorry, could, could you spend a bit more time um, on how you think about competition for capital between businesses you may want to own someday at a price versus? the 10 stocks in the portfolio. <laughs> yeah, and that yeah that's, that's a great question. I think that's one of the toughest things. When, when things get really cheap, um, like to, to, to an extent they did in, in, in December of, of last year, um, what, what I find most difficult is actually when lots of things become cheap at once, because then you kind of almost, there's a tendency to be paralyzed about when there's too many good opportunities, which, which one do you do? And uh, I once saw this, um, this study that, um, if you showed people like uh, two video recorders and one was a great video recorder at a very low price and one was a very bad video recorder uh, at a very high price, people had no problem choosing the great video recorder at the, you know, the cheap price. You know, 100% of people would, would do this. Uh, you can tell the study was a bit old because obviously nobody has video recorders anymore. Um, but the point is still a valid one. And then if you, if you kept those two, if you, then, if you kept those two examples but then added a third video recorder which was kind of okay and okay price, all of a sudden people struggle to, to make a decision. Um, uh, even though it's still actually clear which is which is the best opportunity, but now just by adding new options, people sort of find it more difficult. And, and so that's, um, you know, I think something I struggled with as well. And, you know, unfortunately things tend not to, it's not the case that one stock gets very, very cheap and then everything else um, stays where it was. It's normally the case when there's a little bit of panic that sort of, everything falls in a fairly uniform way. So I, I do think that's a, uh, a tough thing. Um, and what I've found is the better I know a business, um, the more easier it is to kind of pull the trigger when there's a little bit of panic in, in the air. And in the case of Q4, uh, although there were a couple of new businesses that I was thinking very closely about investing as, as new investments, um, ultimately some businesses which I knew really well and still an owner of, um, you know, got, got very cheap, and so um, uh, I prefer to put it into the um, uh, into the old, uh, into some of the existing positions. But uh, I love buying new companies and the relationships that come about when you invest in something new. Um, and so, um, you know, I hope uh, there'll be some, some new additions to the fund uh, this year. Uh, I've got a few good ideas, I think. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Question about uh, Ryman. You pointed out in the letter you alluded to the fact that uh, Ryman is able to off to make more affordable the service they offer by retaining the real estate risk. Uh, and there is a sort of a, the calculating bit of the value they, they offer customers and how they monetize that, that, that value. Um, how do you see them tweaking uh, their uh, business model in case uh, the real estate does not offer such a strong uh, uh, contribution to our, to our underlying uh, profits. Um, so you mean, um, if, if there's no property price appreciation, what can they do to to continue to grow? Or, yeah, most yeah. likely think that uh, the management fees are almost half of what is the sort of sale and resale margin. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so um, one of the main sources of profitability for Ryman Healthcare is that they, they sell these occupancy rights um, um, to a village um, or, or to, a, to an apartment. So let's say, for example, they sell the original occupancy right um, in year one uh, for a million New Zealand dollars. And then when, on average, seven years later, they sell that occupancy right again, uh, two things happen. So if the property market has increased in value, um, they'll book a, a gain on the, on the sale of the um, of the apartment. So if it goes from a million to say two million, they have obviously one million of profit. And they also take a twenty percent um, management fee based off of the value of the occupancy right. So the management fee will also adjust from from being uh, two hundred thousand um, in in year well, for the original sale, and then when it resets to two million, that obviously becomes a four hundred thousand uh, management fee. So Property price inflation is a big driver of how it grows its earnings. But the good thing is because the properties um, um, only recycle on average every seven years, um, we've had a lot of price inflation in New Zealand and Australia over the last seven years as well. So there's a lot of stored up gain over the, all of everything on average over the last six years hasn't yet reset to the, to the new property price level. So even if the property prices would stagnate um, you know, for the next five years, you can still have very, very solid uh, earnings growth um, for Ryman. Um, but then if you were to get into a kind of a structural, you know, if property price inflation were to, to disappear structurally, which I don't think it would because New Zealand is a very attractive place to be. Um, uh, there's a lot of demand for property, um, there's population growth and, and people moving to cities all the things, these type of things. I think it's, it's unlikely, but if that were to happen, the, the, the big opportunity for Ryman is is to simply pay less on the new buildings. So they, they, they can calculate what they need to, for a project to work, and um, uh, they would obviously, that would, you know, a decline in the long term rate, long rate of property price inflation would, would then lead to kind of hopefully them having to pay less for the land on, um, um, you know, on newer projects. But I think the growth for the next um, five years is, is, is almost guaranteed. It is guaranteed. I can't think of a scenario where it would be growth. Danny, you know what i my resident Ryman expert is. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's um, also a very important point. Yeah, so the, the, sorry, the, um, so, so Dan's point um, was that um, you know, if there is a macro downturn, so we're not really talking now about the, the property price inflation, but more of a kind of um, some kind of uh, disruption to the New Zealand property market. Um, you know, in my view, um, Ryman's value proposition is so many multiples better than the competition. It's, it's cheaper, you get a much better service. The atmosphere in the in the villages is is wonderful. You see smiling people everywhere who are active and enjoying their lives. Um, you know the, the proposition is just so much better. Um, you know if there were to be a very, even a very major downturn, I'm almost certain what, what you would see is um, you know the pain accumulating in its competitors and, and Ryman most likely being relatively unaffected uh, by it. Um, I'm sure we'll get there. The chance to test that uh, forecast at some point in the next 10 years. So uh, feel free to, to play this uh, quote back to me when that happens and we'll see, we'll see if uh, I was right or not. You mentioned today Amazon and Alibaba in a positive light. Can you comment on why you've not invested so far? Um, yeah, so I mean, treat, treat my um, comments on companies which I don't own with a pinch of salt because I, I tend to know them much less well than the ones I, I do own. But um, you know, kind of Amazon. I you know, have some, some investing and very close friends, in particular Andreas, uh, who, who asked the question about Amazon earlier. Um, you know, we've spent you know, man days or man weeks discussing whether Apple is better than Google, is better than Amazon, and is better than Facebook, or, or what have you. And it's, it's been a fascinating to kind of have those discussions on how Amazon impacts Google and vice versa and all this kind of stuff. And, Ultimately, um, I chose to invest in Google. Um, um, but um, in, in hindsight, uh, you know, all of them would have been fantastic investments. So I think it was an in interesting intellectual exercise to kind of weigh one against the other. But in, in practice, 
the important thing was actually you owned one of them. <laughs> it didn't matter so much which one it, uh, which one it was. And, and I actually think that's still still the case today. Um, and I know it's it was probably a contrarian idea for a small cap or a then small cap value investor like me to be invested in Google uh, back when I bought it in 2011. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people shook their heads and what on earth is he thinking about where's his edge in big tech in the US. Um, but whereas today, obviously, clearly, companies, especially Amazon, is very much a consensus type idea, but you know, the world is just moving in their direction and will continue to move in their direction. And um, I don't think anyone should be embarrassed by owning one of those, those companies. I mean, it's, to me, it makes, makes total sense. About 20 minutes to go, then you can hit the, hit the slopes. Uh, Rob, uh, this may be a massively unfair question. Uh, given that, given the excellent businesses in the portfolio, what you know, one or two companies do you think have the highest probability ten plus year organic growth runways in front of them? Wow, that's a that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> just having a quick think about what I put in the in the portfolio. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, this, that, that was the question was actually posed by Will Thorndike, who is the dean of uh, you know kind of companies that make acquisitions. So it's kind of interesting. He's asking a question about uh, <laughs> organic growth. So so thank you for that. Um, um, well, cl clearly the company which is growing organically much much faster than everything else in the portfolio is, is actually Facebook at the moment, which is kind of weird. You, know, you would think you know small companies would have big opportunities and large companies would. You know, have just by definition of their size smaller opportunities, um, and um, you know the really the world has a little bit been turned up on, on its head by by the internet, where you know there's been these winner take all effects, and it's actually been the larger companies I think have captured a lot, a lot of the growth, um, whereas some of these sort of small niche machine type building companies they, they might be small, but their markets are also quite small, so the, the opportunity is a, a little bit more limited. So you know, I think. Certainly, Facebook is the one growing organically the strongest at the moment. Um, will that be the case, um, you say, five years into the future? Um, you know, clearly, it's such a big company, the growth rate will definitely moderate in the coming years. But you know, there's still so much opportunity for it. Um, you know, WeChat, uh, sorry, WeChat or WhatsApp has really not been monetized in any meaningful way um, today. Um, and. Um, you know, so there still seems to be quite a lot of opportunity for it on conversion as well. So, um, you know, the ads you get um, on Facebook or Instagram today are um, not the best they could possibly be. Um, so there's there's an opportunity for it to improve the quality of the ad that the person gets, which would obviously increase the amount that advertisers can bid for those ads. So, to me, it looks like there's still a lot of uh, growth opportunity there. Um, so. Yeah, maybe maybe Facebook will be my response. Yeah. Um, you mentioned buying more Trupanion, and then you mentioned it in the same sentence as buying more Facebook. Uh, two things are linked with what what's happened to both companies last year. Both have had a lot of reputational damage in the media <coughs> to a lesser extent. Trupanion, but I've had a look at it. Uh, basically, that they, um, that True Panion were being accused of a bit of malpractice in the way they gather their uh, sales leads. Um, and really, the question is you clearly don't think it's a big factor. And the question is how you actually keep that in proportion when you're assessing the damage, given there's a lot of um, noise in the sort of financial media about such a thing. It affects the stock price evidently, and obviously you decided to buy at the bottom. So it's a question of how you keep that in proportion in terms of the actual uh, dollars and cents damage to the company it will have. Yeah. Well, um, clearly there was reputational damage to, to Facebook uh, last year. But should I focus my answer more on Trupanion, or do you want me to talk about both? Oh, no, no, no. I, I mean, I don't think there was any reputational damage to, to Trupanion last year. But there was certainly a lot of negative commentary about its sales practices. And, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, um, you know, I've I've got a number of investments in financial type companies. Um, 
you know, so this compendium which you mentioned, um, this credit acceptance um, um, through PSG, we are also invested in, in Capitec in South Africa, which is a bank as well. Um, and what I've seen on more or less all of these companies is, and, and for that matter, virtually all, all other financial companies as well, is sort of very aggressive, convincing, short reports about how they're doing everything wrong and the business is going to uh, it's going to be closed down by regulators, and it's all, all going going to go away. And um, I've, I've got nothing against those analyses. Uh, I, I think they're, they're from time thoughtful, and there's absolutely no nothing wrong with um, you know taking a critical view of a company. But I do think um, you know that basically the the amount of regulation has just spiraled into sort of you know almost infinite amounts. And, um, uh, and a lot of the time, I don't think any one person could know what all the regulation is. And, and even if that person did, you know, they would probably find that some of it even contradicts each other. So, so whatever way you do things, you're probably going to be um, upsetting someone. And you know, I think it's been a, uh, an attractive area for short sellers is to, to dig really deep into one aspect of the regulation um, and find um, areas where they think the finance companies are um, not in, in compliance, and, and I think that's a, a legitimate uh, exercise to do. Um, but I do think um, sometimes they miss the kind of woods, woods for the trees. Um, you know, ultimately, what is a regulator, um, you know, gonna, you know, what, what are they really trying to figure out? And, you know, regulator, the big picture is, you know, is, is the company helping its customers or, or is it not helping its customers? Um, and clearly, I think that's the case in credit acceptance, which also had a lot of uh, short reports written about it. And, and I also think, uh, obviously, Capitec as well. Um, and also, True um, You know, ultimately, it sells medical insurance for pets. Is that a valuable product for people? Um, most people would agree it is. Um, you know, if, if your pet uh, requires um, treatment, it can be very expensive. And um, obviously, you don't want to get into a situation where you can't afford that, and the pet has to be put down. So it's um it's a very valuable product for caring pet owners. So the product is needed, and in terms of true panning per se, you know, a regulator would see that true panning pays out a lot more in terms of claims relative to what it takes in as premium than the competitors. So on balance, is true panning a good thing in this good space? And a regulator would, would say yes as well. So where you have that kind of sustainability, I'm pretty sure the business will continue to, to do well and flourish. Um, but it's you know it's perfectly possible um, that every now and again it has to make adjustments to its business model and um, you know the regulator might say, hey, you should be doing this differently or that differently. But I don't think they're gonna close the business down. I think they're gonna tell them, you know, hey, try and try and do things a little bit differently. Um, that's my opinion, I might be wrong with you know with seeing it in, in the coming years. Um, but um, you know, as an investor, that's really what you're looking for, a company you know well, where there's a very negative groundswell of opinion against it and the price gets cheap. And if you think, if you take a different opinion to that, that's the, you know, the ideal situation because then you've got an opportunity to potentially buy a, buy a good company very cheaply. So I don't think anyone should be afraid if they see a lot of negative commentary around the companies we invested in, especially if they're financial ones. Um, I think that's what probably makes them attractive investments as opposed to being a negative for them. My question will be on regulatory risk as well, following up on that a bit. Um, what are the odds, in your opinion, that uh, we see a certain type of regulatory action over the next five years uh, to Facebook, Google, or Amazon? How do you think this action um, might look like, and which company do you think is the most likely to be targeted? Yeah, um, so. You know, clearly Facebook and Google are very much in the crosshairs of regulators, and there's going to be there's going to be a probably a tsunami of regulation hitting them uh, in the coming years. Um, and some of that is probably you know, um, you know, and, and on balance, will it be you know, so so that's clearly going to happen. So I'm not you know not disputing there's going to be a lot of regulatory intervention. The question is you know how damaging it's going to be to the business. Um, my personal view is that it most likely won't be damaging and it might even be helpful um, because you know regulation you know a lot of people here are fund managers as you know kind of regulation is great for the incumbents because they have the resources to, to make sure they're compliant whereas for you guys uh, like you 
uh, you don't have infinite checkbooks to, to pay, pay for that stuff. So, um, you know, I think on, on balance regulation can actually be, be kind of helpful to, to incumbents rather than, rather than vice versa. Um, and also it's maybe an opportunity for, in particular, Facebook, I think, to, to maybe improve its ecosystem and put people's minds at risk at some of the, the, the aspects that they feel more nervous about on Facebook. So in that respect as well, I think it could, could, be, could be a positive for Facebook. So the, the one thing I don't think, I'm, I'm pretty sure won't happen, is some kind of closing down type scenario um, or business going away type scenario. Because you know, like I said earlier in my discussion about cities, um, clearly, crimes happen in cities and murders happen in cities, but unbalanced cities are wonderful things which uh, where all our, our growth come from. And I would make the same case for Facebook. So it's very easy to think of negative use cases for, for Facebook, but I think what, what people miss is how much value is created on the network. So my sister Alex here uh, has a social media networking business um, where she effectively finds small businesses and helps them to connect them with potential clients. And that obviously creates customers for, for her, her clients, creates jobs, creates wealth. And that's um, uh, you know, an incredibly important thing for an economy. And I think, I think there's a statistic um, that 1% you know, of GDP is advertising. I, I disagree with that for, for, for other reasons, but let's just say for the sake of argument it's 1%. So the inverse of 1% of is, is 100. So if you take you know, kind of Facebook's and Google's combined um, revenue and times that by 100, you could have argued that's the amount of economic activity that is, is effectively created and dependent uh, upon those platforms. I know that overstates the number a little bit as there's other ways to advertise if they weren't there, but, um, but they're, they're incredible motors of, of growth and value for creation for our, our economy. So the, the idea that they're somehow going to go away is, is in my view, crazy. Yeah. Alex, you wanted to say? I just wanted to say, like, when it all happened, you know, it was all on the news and it was really bad and everyone was like, oh my god. And for me, if working in sort of digital advertising on Facebook, I was like, how's this going to impact us? And actually, it did have a small impact for a short amount of time. Facebook withdrew some of its targeting options. But then what it actually gave us was more advanced and more improved targeting options. So what we found actually over the course of the year is the quality of leads that we're, we're generating for clients are actually of a higher quality. So whilst that happened, we've actually seen it, I mean, I'm on the smaller end of, of the, the, the business in, in digital advertising, it's actually had a very positive impact now on my, on my company from what was a, you know, a rocky time when it, when it all happened in the news. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, I promised we had discussed that before. <laughs> Hi Rob. Hi. Thanks again for the event. Just then, uh, portfolio question on how you feel about your portfolio in, in aggregate, say compared to its history. Uh, here you have a wonderful tenure record. Um, your second flight better than your first, which is very, is quite unusual. I mean, people often you know rest on their early years, and you've know, you been getting better as as you, as you go on. And how, how, you want to, uh, how does um, how, how does the overall quality of your portfolio feel to its history, you know, clearly your quality bias has gone up, your more widely bias has gone up, um, you know, but maybe you haven't traded that away by which you're not, and I know the, you know, the sides of the two angels on their shoulders. Um, yeah, you just get a sense of how the portfolio feels today for, say, you know, people who might incrementally be looking at your, yeah. to your uh, portfolio. I, I feel as positive as I have done for quite a long while, to be honest. Um, um, partly because of you know there was a big price decrease in the, in the fourth quarter and the fund was down about sixteen percent. So that means things on balance are sixteen percent cheaper. Um, but I also think the kind of the quality and the perspectives of the businesses are also better today than they were probably five years ago. So you know just been talking about Facebook and how optimistic that can continue to grow at a very rapid rate. And we heard from Christina this morning about how the target is to grow at fifteen percent a year, but this year given all the kind of acquisitions they made, it's Yes, potentially going to be a little bit, or a lot better than that. So, if I look across the board, I see businesses doing really, really well, um, and the prices are actually, you know, come down quite a bit as well. So, um, I feel quite positive um, about the portfolio. But there's no prediction on what's going to happen next year. I and mean, I never guess correctly what the portfolio do on a one-year basis. Um, you know, who knows what, what could happen? But I think if the businesses do what I think they're going to do, 
um, that at some point over the next five years um, that will be reflected in the price. Rob, since it's almost 12, my question will be, how will this all end? Will it end with your death? Will you retire and give the money back? Will you close the fund? Will you all end up with mediocre returns? What's the end game? <laughs> well, it, it will, my, my death will happen at some point, so uh, there's no question about that. Um, no, I mean, uh, uh, the, the Question was, by the way, asked by Georg Scholberg, who's is something of a legend in uh, in this meeting. Uh, he's been on the panel for for the last few years for the emerging managers. And uh, after the event, I always get about uh, 100 emails from people asking who he is. So uh, this is this is he. Um, I think you're taking a break from the panel tomorrow. But, um, hopefully, we can persuade you to come back next year. Uh, but anyway, we'll see about that. No, but you know, a lot of fund management, a lot of fund managers try to build fund management businesses, so um, they probably start off as talented capital allocators, because that's why they get given capital to begin with, but then they want to kind of step back from their, their capital allocation, give the business, create a business, and then give it a longevity beyond their own lives, so they can potentially sell it, or, or retire, or, or whatever. And the result of that is they actually, at some point, stop doing the capital allocation, and start really managing and creating a business. And of course, to the extent the reason the fund had good performance to begin with was, was due to the talents of that person, and clearly the performance is going to deteriorate if that person is no longer exercising those talents. So for me, the conclusion is, I think it's actually a mistake to try and build a fund for a business. I think what everyone should try to do is try and build a, a capital allocation track record uh, and focus on that, and, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, I have no intention ever to hire analysts to do my job, I enjoy my job, I want to pay someone else to do it and then have to manage them instead. I can't rule out that I won't have to hire people for kind of compliance or administrative type of stuff uh, over time, but um, so far that's not the case and it doesn't look like it's going to become the case. Um, so what I'm trying to do is build a really great long-term track record, um, but when I cease um, to be the person making the capital allocation decisions for whatever reason that might be, um, and there is no reason for the fund to continue to, to exist. Um, um, people should you know, basically withdraw their, you know, take their funds back. It's, there should be no panic about that if, uh, if I'm not here. Um, I think we have very good companies. If, you know, if there's three or, three or four months where the portfolio needs to be liquidated while, uh, um, while people, for people to get their money back, I don't think they should worry about having money in Grinka for so three months or whatever without me being, being there as a manager. Um, no, so um, you know when when I'm not there, then the business owner fund will, will cease to exist as well. Um, so that's the answer. Um, in terms of my children, uh, I've no idea if they're interested in, in fund management. Um, um, I hope so, because I think it's a, a fun thing to do. But to the extent they are, um, um, you know, they they should um, they should start their own funds and then try to acquire uh, investors on their on their own merits rather than kind of. Um, you, know, you, know, you know, live off the, the investors that, uh, that I acquired and which will most probably over time leave because if I'm the reason um, they, they came in the first place then you know, most likely they, they, they won't want to, to stay in the very long term. So um, if, that's, if that's what they want to do then they, they should just uh, go and start their own funds. And I'm sure I'd be supportive of that. But they're not going to manage business either. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> okay, I can't believe it. The time flew by super fast, but it's all, almost midday. I know there's some people very hungry to get onto the onto the slope. So thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you up on the mountain.